So as Danny says, in case you couldn't tell, we did have VBS, um, and we had a party. So um, I have two VBS friends with me to help me do the call to worship this morning. So Miss Carly, can you tell us what our theme for VBS was? Start the party. And Wesley, what were we celebrating? The good news. And Miss Carly, can you tell us what the Bible verse for VBS was? Acts 22 says, you always show me the path that leads to life. You will fill me with joy when I am with you. And Wesley, what does this verse remind us of? This verse reminds us that God reveals the way to live a meaningful life and fills us with joy when we seek his presence. Let us approach our time of worship with hearts open to receive his guidance and experience the joy that comes from being in his presence. The Good Father.
Amen. Please be seated. Uh, the kids learned how to follow Jesus, and we learned about uh, light in the darkness, and we learned about the good news. Yep, and we, we got to play truth or hair. Yeah, we played truth or hair. We played uh, flashlight tag in the sanctuary, and it was awesome. So we are just here to uh, thank you all for sharing your kids, and we've got a slideshow that they're getting ready to play, and then the kids are going to sing. We also got. I only get to wear popsicle shorts once at church, so. <laughs> Thanks. Party people, where you at? It's time to celebrate. It's time to get it started. The party's happening here. That's right. I turn up the music loud. Dance like nobody's watching. We got a reason to cheer. Shine! 
Awesome. Thank you. I think I'm up next. <laughs> Making sure I had it right. Wow, that should put joy in your heart, right? What a week in we had. Uh, thanks again for sharing your children with us. Thanks again to all the workers. Um, there's lots of people put hours into this thing long before we, we get here. And I'm not one of them, actually. We have, Heather has put together a team, and her team have done uh, a yeoman share of the work. Uh, I pitch in here and there, but... They have really done a lot behind the scenes as we've gotten ready. Uh, we picked this out over a year ago, as a matter of fact, to, to get ready for it. So thank you all for your work. And uh, the ladies down in the kitchen, they never get much attention and thanks. And they work, again, for weeks on end preparing for that. So thank you all for that. And our crew up in the AV booth who was willing to be here every night, uh, just uh, so many people to thank, but what a, what a great uh, we crafts, all the work that goes into that to get ready, but uh, most of all, we're just grateful for all these kids. We are so blessed as a community to have these kids in our lives and in our church. What a blessing is ours, and uh, give, give glory to God for that, okay? Well, let's pray together. Lord, we are so grateful for all the children you have brought to us during Vacation Bible School weekend. And we're grateful for every child you've brought uh, into our church and into our community. We just praise you for each one. And we, we ask that you would bless them, that you would keep watch over them, that you would protect them, we ask, oh God, that you would keep them from harm of any type. We pray most of all that you would draw them to yourself and they would know your saving grace. We pray that seeds were planted even this weekend, and that their parents and grandparents and others will keep watering those seeds in their lives and they will grow to fruition. Lord, and they'll come to your saving grace. Just draw each one of them to yourself. Bless their parents, bless their grandparents, bless all the significant adults in their lives and use them for your glory. Encourage them to keep sharing Christ with these children. And Lord, would you especially remind parents that there is no greater calling than to care for their children. There's no greater calling on this earth in my mind than being godly parents and grandparents. So use these parents and grandparents to further your kingdom. Lord, we thank you for all the volunteers who work such long hours to prepare for Bible school, for all those who, who served throughout the actual event. Bless them for their service, O Lord, and grant them some well-deserved rest. We pray for our church. We pray that we will always be a church who unreservedly reservedly proclaims the gospel. And that we're be, we will be a church that ministers to people of all ages and all walks of life. And speaking of that, Lord, we ask that you would minister unto those who are hurting, that you would come and heal them, and that you would use us as your agents of healing. O oh Lord, restore your people today and remind us all, every one of us, that we can come home to you. All this we pray in the name of Jesus, the one who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts 
as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Stand and sing with us, I Got Saved. <clears throat> Let's pray together. Father, we come again to praise you. We praise you again for this Vacation Bible School weekend that we've had, and we pray that the celebration of who you are and 
and what you've done for us will continue in our lives. Lord, we come now to celebrate your word, to gather around your word once again, to hear your word read and proclaimed. We pray that all that is done here is pleasing in your sight. We pray that it glorifies your holy name and you alone. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Well, as you know full well by now, we had a vacation Bible school weekend and, and had a great weekend. Uh, it was a joy-filled weekend, to say the least. And in fact, I was very tempted to wear my 80s warm-up suit uh, again this morning. I, I know, probably should have. But I was afraid none of you would take me seriously. if I. And you maybe don't take me seriously anyway. I don't know, but you wouldn't have if I'd have worn uh, the suit. But we had a great time starting the party, did we not? Uh, I mean, on Thursday, we heard about the party Jesus invites us to, that he invites us to abundant and eternal living. We, we learned about Levi or Matthew and how Matthew threw a party for Jesus and tax collectors and sinners were there and Jesus was calling them to repentance. At the end of Vacation Bible School on Saturday, we were reminded that we're to be party starters that we're to go out and share the light of Jesus with others. We're to urge them to come to the party, abundant and eternal. And then on Friday, we had this jewel that is our text this morning. It's the parable of the lost son, uh, or the parable of the prodigal son, as most of us know it. At VBS, we were invited to celebrate the good news so I want to invite us to continue the celebration this morning as we look at this story. I'm going to read from uh, Luke 15, verses 11 to 24. I'm not going to look at the very end of the story we did at Vacation Bible School with the older son. Uh, maybe we'll look at that some other time. But Luke uh, 15, verses 11 to 24. And he said, that is Jesus, there was a man who had two sons. And the younger of them said to his father, Father, give me, the share, my share, give me the share of property that's coming to me. And he divided his property between them. Not many days later, the younger son gathered all he had and he took a journey into a far country. And there he squandered the property in reckless living. And when he had spent everything, a severe famine arose in the country and he began to be in need. And so he went and he hired himself out to one of the citizens of that country who sent him into his fields to feed pigs. And he was longing to be fed with the pods that the pigs ate, and no one gave him anything. But when he came to himself, he said, How many of my father's hired servants have more than enough bread, but I perish here with hunger? I will arise and go to my father, and I'll say to him, Father, I've sinned against heaven and before you, and I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. Treat me as one of your hired servants. And he arose and he came to his father, but while he was still a long way off, his father saw him, and he felt compassion, and he ran and embraced him and kissed him. And the son said to his father, Father, I've sinned against heaven and before you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, Bring quickly the best robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his hand and shoes on his feet. And bring the fattened calf and kill it and let us eat and celebrate. For this my son was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. And they began to celebrate. Thanks be to God. Amen. Ministers often say that the challenge with a text like this is to preach the text in a refreshing manner. And that's certainly true to some extent. But the parable of the prodigal son is a rich and beautiful text. So maybe the challenge is not to tell it in a new way, but make sure we continue to understand it. It's not about finding some new and refreshing meaning. In fact, to do so could be heretical if we're not careful. Instead, we want to let the original text speak to us and tell us its meaning. Having said that, I think to some extent we've clouded the real meaning of the text 
by giving it the title, The Prodigal Son. I, I do believe more appropriate would be to title it The Parable of the Loving Father. You, you see, the son's not the hero. The father is. It's not primarily about the son's sin. It's a part of it. But it's primarily about a father's love, the father's love. The son's really not special or extraordinary. He's a sinner like you and me, and we should certainly make that connection. That's important. But the one who is special, the one who is extraordinary, is the father in the story. Spoiler alert, he represents God. And we see this father's love in juxtaposition with the son's rebellion at the very beginning. Verses 11 and 12, and he said there was a man who had two sons. And the younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the share of property that is coming to me. And he divided his property between them. Folks, this was a slap in the face of the father. In fact, I suspect Jesus' first century audience gasped at this point. Particularly in that day in that culture, to ask for one's inheritance before the father had died was like saying, Dad, you know what? I wish you were dead. But since you won't go ahead and die off, will you just give me my money now? And we've probably seen that, right? All of a sudden, somebody gets sick, they're near the end of life, or somebody's died, all of a sudden, relatives come out of the woodworks. They're just hoping there might be something there for them. But this son had dishonored his father. And under Mosaic law, the father could have rightly gone so far as to have his son stoned to death at that point. This was a serious insult. This was a serious offense against the father. But what did the father do? The text says he simply divided his property between them. I think Jesus' audience would have gasped again at this point. Amazingly, because of this father's love and despite his serious insult, this young man leaves with his pockets full. And it wasn't money and possessions he had earned. Oh, I, I suspect he had worked a little on the family farm, but he had money in his pocket because of his father's great love and his father's great grace. Surely the father knew the dangers of giving this boy his inheritance all at once. He, he must have at least suspected where it might lead. But he gave his son his inheritance knowing that he was going to have to learn the hard way. And eventually, he did learn. But first the son went off for party time. And not the kind of party we've been talking about in Vacation Bible School. Jesus said, verse 13, not many days later, the younger son gathered all he had and he journeyed into a far country and there he squandered his property in reckless living. I think it was R.C. Sproul who first said that, that this son maybe went on the biggest and greatest and longest spring break ever. And he didn't wind up at Daytona Beach. Oh no, verses 15 and 16 tell us he eventually spent everything he had and he wound up feeding the pigs, slopping pigs, if you will. He had stooped so low that he longed to eat the slop that the pigs ate. But no one gave him anything. My friends, he had fallen to rock bottom, particularly for a Jewish man. Now the Pharisees were really paying attention to Jesus' parable because they were all about ritual purity. They were all about cleanliness. Their mouths must have fallen open for no Jew would be associated, even come close to swine. Now Jesus doesn't give us the details of this man's reckless living, but I suspect the young man had a lot of friends as long as the money was there. I suspect he had a lot of friends as long as the party continued. But where were those friends now? Jesus said no one 
gave them any, him anything. And no one means no one, not even his so-called friends. Back in high school, I worked at a small uh, store in Cleveland, North Carolina, called Community Grocery Hardware and Grill. It's a mouthful. Uh, I'll tell you more about the store uh, sometime later. But there were a lot of men and women who came in and out of that store in my high school days whom I admired. And they, I learned a lot of positive things from those men and women. But there was an old fellow who taught me a valuable lesson uh, when I was about 16 years old of so-called fair-weather friends. This old fellow was still working some odd jobs. In fact, he, he had pigs of his own, and he sold a few pigs every now and then. But he would come in almost every Friday afternoon and, and cash his meager paycheck at our store. And he always had a couple of young guys with him. And after they got a few drinks in the old fella, he would come back in the store all weekend long and he would buy them everything they wanted, mostly cigarettes and beer. But come Monday evening, the old fella was back in our store and he was asking for credit to buy him some groceries to get him through the week because he and his so-called friends had squandered his entire paycheck. And the friends at that point were nowhere to be found. I'm speculating, but I wonder if the young son in this parable had experienced something kind of like that. Either way, Jesus tells us no one gave him anything. But then Jesus says, verse 17, that he came to himself. In other words, he came to his senses. He, he realized there was at least one who had not been a fair-weather friend. There was at least one who had always stood by him. And he remembered the love of his father. He remembered that even his, fire, his father's hired hands had enough food to eat. And so he would go, verses 18 and 19, and he would repent. He would acknowledge that he was certainly no longer worthy to be a son, but he thought, maybe dad, maybe dad will let me be one of his servants. And, and at least I'll have something to eat. And then here comes the truly amazing part of this story. The father did so much more. His love for his son was so much deeper than the son could even imagine. Verse 20 says, he rose and he came to his father. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him. And he got mad at him, right? Not what it says, did it? His father said he had compassion. He ran to him. He hugged him. And he kissed him. A fellow by the name of John Killinger has noted that if this part of the parable were to happen today, it might go something like this. The young son finally manages to get a bus ticket home. And at dawn, the bus pulls up outside the bus stop, and he tumbles off. He's wrinkled, unshaven, a little worried about how he will be received at home. And then a voice calls, son, son, is that you? And there's his father at the station. But dad, I, how did you know I'd be here, especially at this hour? And the bus station agent says, are you kidding, boy? Your old man's been down here two or three times a day, every day, since you left, just hoping you would come home. We can't say for certain, but in light of the fact of the father's abundance, in light of the fact that the father went running to him, I think it's safe to say that he had been looking for him day after day after day, that he had been longing for this son to come home. And when he did, the father went to him. He went running to him. He embraced him. He kissed him. In that culture, short of an emergency, an older man did not run. It was seen as beneath his dignity. And in that culture, children came to the parents, not the other way around. But the father didn't care. His love for his son was so great, he didn't care what the neighbors thought. 
He didn't care about Middle Eastern code and etiquette. His love for his son was so great that he ran to him. And notice verse 22, the father didn't say to his servant, you know, that boy of mine, he's wasted every dime I've ever given him. So go down there, there's a, there's a bush over there, and I want you to break off two sturdy limbs, and I'm going to whip that boy within an inch of his life. He didn't say that. And that would have been acceptable punishment in that culture. But not only did the father hug him and kiss him, and, but before the son could even hardly get out his rehearsed story, the father said, quick, don't need to hear any more. My best robe in the closet in there, go get it. That ring I only wear at special occasions, go get it for my boy. Those shoes, look, the boy doesn't even have shoes. Go get my best pair and put it on him. And he was declaring, especially with the shoes, that this is my son. Servants went barefoot. But the master and his family never went barefoot. He was declaring again with all those actions, this is my boy. He's come home. And the father said, verses 23 and 24, bring the fattened calf. We're going to celebrate. For the son of mine was dead and now he's alive. He was lost and he's found. Someone has suggested that that calf never stood a chance. That the dad started fattening that calf up as soon as his boy left in hopes that maybe he would come home. What love. What amazing love. And this father and his love is represented the love that the Lord has for you and for me. The parable expresses God's great love for sinners like us. We're lost and God longs for us to come home. We slap God in the face with our own versions of reckless living. We've gone off to our own far countries. We've all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. We're not even worthy to be servants of God, much less daughters and sons. But, Romans 5, 8, but God demonstrates His love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. As the father in the parable could have waited for his son to come to him and, and repent and seek to make things right, our heavenly father could have waited for us. But he didn't because we couldn't make things right. He came running to us in the person of Jesus. As the son was clothed in the robe, so God has clothed us with the righteousness of Christ. 1 John 1, if we confess our sins, God's faithful and just to cleanse us and forgive us and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. As the father put shoes on his son's feet, indicating he was a servant, he was a son, not a servant. So we, Romans 8, 15, did not receive the spirit of slavery, but the spirit of adoption. By Christ, we are sons and daughters of the living God. I don't know where you're at this morning. I, I don't know if you've never turned your life toward your heavenly Father. I, I don't know if you did, and maybe for a season you've been wandering off. Maybe you've been off in a far country for a while. But this parable is gospel. And the gospel truth is, if you'll turn towards the Lord, He'll come running to you. No one, no one is beyond His love. No one is so far gone that God will not kiss you and bestow upon you the robe and the ring and so much more. If you've been in a, a far country, if you've been wandering far from God, He's been watching for you. I promise you, He's been down at the bus station every morning looking for you. Longing for you to come home. He's waiting for you to understand that you're lost in your sins, and though you're not worthy, you can come home. If you'll turn. I know from experience 
that he will come running to you. I was wondering myself in my own spring break, my own extended party my freshman year in college. I hate to admit it, but it's true. Praise God, I heard the gospel in the spring of 82, and he came running to me. He's been running to me ever since. And he'll come running to you as well. And the joy of the party described in our text is not exaggerated. Though, though it's a wonderful illustration, even it falls short. Jesus said in Luke 15, verse 7, there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents over ni- than over 99 righteous persons who need no repentance. Do you want to start the party? Do you really want to start the party? Then may today be the day of your repentance. The day when you turn to the Lord. Let's pray together. And I want to ask everyone to to please keep your eyes closed. I'm not going to look myself. This is between you and God. But if you've never trusted Him, or if you have and you've been wandering off in a far country, or maybe you know this morning that there's something in particular I I just need to repent of. I need to turn towards God. If that's you, again, No one else needs to see, but I would ask you to acknowledge it by simply raising your hand a bit as we pray. And just acknowledge before God that you need to turn to Him. And we're all trusting this morning that He's going to come running to us. So would you pray with me? Lord, maybe there's one who's never turned towards you. Maybe there's one who's denied you all their lives. And Lord, I just ask this morning, if if they'd just make a, a slight turn towards you, would you come running to them? Would you show them that you are real? Show them how much you love them? Maybe there's one saying, well, if Danny knew what I'd done, he wouldn't be saying that. Well, I don't know, but you know, Lord, and you are saying that. Oh, God, embrace them. Hug them. Put on your robe of righteousness. Show them that you're one of their daughters and sons. And, Lord, maybe there's some of us who've walked with you for many years, but we have sin in our lives that we need to repent of. We confess that now. And we turn toward you. Lord, this father didn't spare the fattened calf. But Lord, you didn't spare your only son. You gave him for us. And so we turn to you now. We feel you running towards us. Come and embrace us. And call us your own. Thank you for your love and your grace in Jesus. In his name we pray. Amen. Please stand and sing with us, Reckless Love. So, so good. 
the Lord is doing a work in your life or has done a work in your life this morning and you would like to talk with someone about it, I'm always available for you. Ultimately, as I said, it's between you and the Lord, but sometimes people want to talk, so I'm, I'm always here for you and to help you just continue to know how much the Lord is turning towards you and loves you. Okay. Now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with all of you today and forevermore. Amen.